I want to thank everyone for, um, my lab did move about a year ago, but I feel like I'm still learning the virology community here, and so I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to attend and also present some of my group's work. Um, the story I'll tell you about today has been very much a collaboration between members of my lab, and they're pi pictured here, and the research groups of Nathaniel Gray and Eric Fisher. We all started collaborating when we were still at Harvard. Um, and more recently, we, uh, we've started collaborating with Adam Bailey to do some work with yellow fever virus. And thanks to the excellent talks we heard this morning, I could zip through in the introduction. A lot of our work is motivated by the fact that we don't have good countermeasures against most of the viruses that cause human disease. We do have, however, a very um, successful paradigm for antiviral therapy, and that involves using um, highly potent direct-acting antivirals that bind to a viral protein and inhibit or somehow derange the normal function of that protein. And these are mostly targeting viral enzymes, so viral proteases, polymerase, HIV integrase, et cetera. And we use these agents, um, they, we need them to have very high potency, and we also use them in combination in order to avoid the development of resistance. Um, the challenges to this strategy are like, one, there's a practical challenge in that it's hard to develop in real time direct acting antivirals for emerging and newly emerging viruses. But in addition to that, most of these direct acting antivirals have fairly narrow spectrum activity, the one bug, one drug problem, um, especially when you compare them to, say, commonly used antibiotics or antifungal agents. There's also an issue that when we use these direct acting antivirals as monotherapy, resistance can develop quite rapidly. And these problems are especially um, challenging for RNA viruses due to the ability of those viruses to generate genetic diversity. And so with that background in mind, my lab over the years has been very interested in developing new antiviral targets or validating new antiviral targets, but also developing new pharmacological strategies to try to achieve an antiviral effect. And as one example of that, we became very interested and um, we became very inspired by work being done by our chemical biology colleagues in cancer biology and oncology um, to start pursuing targeted protein degradation as a strategy. And so because this is a short talk, I can't give extensive background on the targeted protein degradation field, but the idea is that instead of binding a small molecule to the viral protein and inhibiting or deranging the function, instead you use small molecule binding to drive or direct that viral protein um, towards a degradation pathway. And so there are many flavors of targeted protein degradation now. There are um, molecular glues, there are protax, there are litax, autax. The flavor of targeted protein degradation I'll tell you about today is this one, in which we have these small molecules that are bifunctional, and on one side we have a ligand for a viral protein of interest, and that's linked covalently to a ligand for a given E3 ubiquitin ligase. All of the work I'll tell you about today utilizes E3 ligands derived from thalidomide, um, and that binds specifically to cerebellum, which is the substrate recognition subunit of this particular E3 ubiquitin ligase. And so these bifunctional molecules are referred in the literature as degronomids or protax for proteolysis targeting chimeras. I think the most generic term is degrader, and that's the term that I will use for most of the talk. And so we became interested in this for multiple reasons, and to get into that, I want to compare and contrast sort of the functional inhibition approach versus trying to target something for protein degradation. And so for, on the left, if we have inhibition, again, we have a small molecule that binds to a viral protein. It has to bind in a way that interferes with normal function. Um, to make those kinds of inhibitors in general, it's very helpful, if not essential, to know what the biochemical function is, right? And then I think that's why, you know, making protease inhibitors, making polymerase, in, making um, antivirals that target polymerases, is a common approach because we fundamentally understand what those proteins do. Um, that said, there are many, many viral proteins that we know are essential for replication. They should be good antiviral targets, but in many cases we don't understand enough about their biochemical function to rationally design an inhibitor um, or to set up even assays that would enable high throughput screening against those targets, right? So that's a challenge. Um, in addition, the pharmacology of an inhibitor is driven by binding, right? The pharmacology is occupancy driven, and that if the small molecule dissociates, in general, the protein is immediately active and the virus can replicate. And so as a result, you know, we need very tight binding in order to achieve the kind of antiviral potencies that would be useful. And to contrast with that, if we're going for a targeted protein degradation strategy, one thing that we were interested in is that by removing the protein from the cell, um, 
we're ablating all of its functions. And as we heard from Scott's talk this morning, many viral proteins have multiple functions. And when you take an inhibitor strategy, you're usually addressing only one of those functions. Um, whereas if you remove the protein from the cell by ha inducing its degradation, you're ablating all the functions. And in fact, you're ablating functions you may not even know about yet. So that was attractive to us. Um, we're attracted by the fact that restoration of function requires new protein synthesis. And although viruses can be very good at accomplishing this, that's still a harder ask than simply having a small molecule dissociate. Okay. The pharmacology in this case, although you do need binding, the pharmacology is actually driven by the event of ubiquitination and degradation of the viral protein which means that we don't need stoichiometric occupancy and we don't necessarily need really long residence times in order to achieve significant antiviral activity. And that was attractive to us. And in fact, if you think about it, uh, and, and you probably want the small molecule to come off because then each small molecule can iteratively um, induce degradation of multiple copies of the viral protein of interest. Okay, and the other aspect of this pharmacology being event-driven is that our colleagues in cancer biology had demonstrated amply that, in this case, lower affinities can actually be sufficient to achieve the kind of pharmacology that you need without having really, really tight binding. So that was interesting to us, and in particular in the context of spectrum of activity and resistance, we were interested in, in examining this idea. And that's, again, because for the functional inhibitors, you need binding to have antiviral activity. And any sort of substitution in the compound binding site generally will reduce binding and reduce antiviral activity. And so that those substitutions could be could reflect natural diversity out in nature, you know, out in the wild. And it could also reflect you know, variants that arise during drug treatment. But in both cases, you know, we were interested in the hypothesis that compounds that had this targeted protein degradation mechanism might be more resilient to all of these genetic variants. Right, that lead to decreased drug binding. So that was the idea we wanted to play around with and investigate in the laboratory. Before we could do that, the first thing was, can we actually make small molecules that have this mechanism of action? And as we, at the start of any new project, um, you question yourself and you come up with all the reasons why it's not gonna work. And so these were some of our reasons that we worried it might not work. And that is one, viruses are very well known to localize their processes to specialized compartments, membrane, you know, specialized membranes, proteinaceous factories. But one of the reasons we think to do that is that it protects, it shields the virus from the host response. And likewise, we were concerned that this could shield the viral protein we wanted to target from the targeted protein degradation machinery that we needed to tap into. I mean, secondly, viruses have evolved mechanisms to ensure robust expression. And so there was a question of if we start degrading or depleting this viral protein, and the, will the virus upregulate it? And we can never deplete enough to see a good antiviral effect. And then related to that is at a certain point where we start to see cytotoxicity because basically we're clogging the proteasomal machinery with this abundant viral protein. Okay. So those were things we had to that we had to worry about and address. And so before we could test our, our idea, we had to answer this, can we actually make compounds that have that activity? And two, then once we had them, we could ask, try to ask some of these questions about resistance profile and spectrum of activity. And so the first system we decided to try to apply this in was the hepatitis C virus, um, in particular HCV um, protease. And the main catalytic subunit of that protease is this NS3 protein. We chose it because we were looking for an experimental model that would be set up sort of for us to, to get to the ideas we were interested in playing around with. And that included that there are multiple FDA-approved drugs targeting that protease. There are high-resolution cocosal structures in the literature. There are really well-defined structure activity relationships in the medicinal chemistry literature. And there are known resistance mutations that we all hope to leverage and build off of the work of our colleagues who developed these drugs. And so this is one of those drugs. This is telaprevir, which is a first generation HCV protease inhibitor. And this is a high resolution co-crystal structure. And what you can see is this pyrazine group here is here. And it looks in the structure to be pointing out into the solvent. And so that's one example where we look at what's known and then we start to ask, well, where can we put a linker and where can we put an E3 ligand? And so we make our general process is we make a number of different candidates where we vary the linker length and the linker composition, and we vary um, the linkage point on both the viral protein ligand as well as on the E3 ligand. 
We test those candidates then to verify that they still bind to both of those components, in one case, NS3 and also Cerebron, and we triage compounds that lose either of those interactions. And we take the remaining compounds and we start examining their effects on NS3 abundance and their antiviral activity. And so for time, I'm not gonna go through the binding data because it's not that interesting, and instead tell you about how we look at NS3 abundance and sort of in some cases, the easiest thing is just to look at infected cells. I think the challenge is that if you see reduced viral protein, you can't tell if it's due to this mechanism that we're trying to enact versus just general antiviral activity. And so to get around that, a lot of times we'll set up a reporter cell line in which we express our protein of interest, in this case NS3, as a fusion with EGFP. And in the expression cassette, that's followed by ribosomal skip sequence and then M-cherry, so that we can use the ratio of GFP and cherry fluorescence as a readout for um, depletion of this NS3 EGFP protein. And so these are data where in black circles, I'm showing the parental inhibitor telaprevir, which doesn't do anything to the abundance of NS3 EGFP, and then three candidate degraders where we see nice concentration dependent reduction in the, in the GFP um, fluorescence, suggesting that we're, we're getting depletion. Um, to ask if we're on mechanism, we can do things chemically to modify the E3 ligand, for example, changing this hydrogen to a methyl group, and others had shown, and we verified for our own compounds, that that significantly reduces the interaction of this ligand with Cerebron. And when we do that, those two compounds lose this depletion activity against NS3 GFP. And we can accomplish the same thing by doing a competition experiment in which we add in excess of just the free E3 ligand to disfavor formation of the ternary complex. And when we did that, by the fluorescence assay, again, we see rescue, or we see significant rescue, restoration of EGFP fluorescence, but also if we look by Western blood at NS3, these are two degraders. This is the negative control for this compound, and then when we do the experiment in the presence of excess E3 ligand, we restore NS3 levels, at least by Western blood. So we do these types of experiments as well as others to convince ourselves that we're depleting our target of interest and we're doing it via the mechanism that we intended. And then we have to ask, are, is it specific? And to get at that, the easiest or the best way for us to get at that is to do proteomics experiments, um, mass-based proteomics experiments. And so on the left is an experiment with an NS3 degrader, and then on the right it's corresponding negative control that can't interact with the E3 ligase. And so for the degrader itself, the only thing we see significantly depleted is this NS3 EGFP protein. And we don't see significant depletion of other um, known substrates substrates known to be depleted by the E3 ligand alone, which was good. And we also don't see depletion of other proteins by the negative control compound. So we do experiments to address specificity of our compounds, and once we're convinced we have something that is on mechanism and that is specific, or fairly specific, specific is always a relative term, <laughs> fairly specific, we go into antiviral assays. And so in this case, Melisson did infections for 24 hours and then started the treatment with the degrader and at the end of 24 hours, in this experiment at the end of 24 hours, um, examined the abundance of NS3 and lysates by Western blot and then also titer progeny virus and the culture supernatants. And so for the Western blot data, Again, first, for telopravir itself, you see this reduction of NS3, but that is just due to antiviral activity, and it's not really Cerebron dependent. Whereas for the degrader, we see this deplete, a more profound depletion of NS3, and we lose that activity when we go to Cerebron, cells lacking Cerebron. And this depletion of NS3 is associated with, with very nice antiviral activity. Okay, so once we had those compounds, we could go back to our idea and ask, well, how do these compounds, well, how do, if we compare these two compounds, how do they perform against um, variants that are known to have telaprevir resistance? And so again, we tapped into the work of our colleagues. Um, Mollison picked these two mutations that had what were documented in the literature to rise in cell culture and as well as in patients after treatment with telaprevir or bosaprevir, which is another first generation HCV and a 3,4A inhibitor. Um, and they had been shown to be stable on this HCV JFH1 background and not to interfere with viral infectivity, so no apparent fitness cost in cell culture. And she repeated this experiment. And so the data on the left are for the parental inhibitor where wild type is in black and the two mutants are in blue and purple. And what you see is either of those point mutations is enough to significantly shift the antiviral activity curve over to the right to higher concentrations or as the antiviral activity of the degrader compound appears to be much less affected by the two point, by either of the point mutations, at least individually. 
the other thing that we did in, in parallel in the laboratory were serial passage experiments. And so if we have passage this virus in the presence of telaprevir, we can recapitulate emergence of these mutations as well as other point mutations documented in the literature. We have not been able to isolate an, a resistant quasi-species after passaging in the presence of this degrader or our, our other NS3 degraders. Although I have to say that's always the negative, negative result, right? It doesn't mean it can't happen, but we haven't observed it yet. Okay, so then the second story I want to tell you about is not with HCV, it's with flaviviruses, which I don't think I need to give background while we're interested in that, so I'm going to skip through this. Um, when, the, when the lab started, again, I was interested in tar non-traditional um, viral targets. And in particular, I was interested in the viral envelope protein, the E protein, you know, which is a structural component. It's on the surface of virions, and it has essential functions mediating attachment, but also membrane fusion during viral entry. But in addition, you can't, as we know from Rebecca's talk, it's, you, you need it in order to make viral particles, right? And so I was, I was interested in the, when we started the lab, the idea of could we have some molecules that have multiple modes of action by binding to this single target? And it wasn't clear how to, do, how, um, to accomplish that. What we were encouraged by was that the work of our structural biology colleagues that, you know, this protein exists in many different structural forms during this replication cycle. During entry, it exists as this prefusion dimer on mature virions, and after exposure to low pH, it reorganizes and refolds as this postfusion trimer. And this structural change is the driving force for membrane fusion. And then similarly, we know that on immature viral particles, after they bud through the ER membrane into the lumen of the ER, E is organized as these trimers in which the chaperone, viral chaperone PRM sits at the tip of the fusion domain, which is the yellow domain. And as those particles then traffic through um, the lumen of the ER, Golgi, trans-Golgi, they undergo processing where PRM is cleaved and then you reorganize as a dimer and ultimately and under physiological pH conditions outside of the cell, the PR peptide um, diffuses away and you get, again, back to the prefusion dimer, which is here. So the fact that they were structural, distinct structures at different points in the replication cycle as a chemist was appealing to me that maybe we could arrest some of these. How to arrest, like where to bind the small molecule to accomplish that was not so obvious, especially on the assembly end, I mean, because ideally we would block the budding the budding itself um, and never let the particle form and it wasn't clear how we could accomplish that. We had more ideas about how to accomplish this and so that's what we set about doing. Um, and because this is a short talk, I can't go into that work, but over the course of the last 10 years, we have made various um, small molecule inhibitors that bind to this form of the protein and block these structural changes and prevent formation of the fusion pore. And so that is all published work. I don't want to go into it, although I will point out that Bianca Linden from my lab is giving a poster on some of these compounds and resistance mutations to them. Um, if you have time to go check it out, it's very nice work. Um, we had, since we had these, and we knew that they were validated ligands of this form of the protein, we fed them into our targeted protein degradation projects and started to try to make degraders based off of them. And we picked two chemically independent ones. These are 4,6-disubstituted pyrimidine series. This is a 2,4-diaminopyrimidine series. We went through the same process of making candidates and arrived at these two um, degrader molecules that I've labeled GNF2 DEG for the degrader derived from GNF2 and then 212-2 DEG derived from this parental. And what you can see is that in both cases we see nice concentration-dependent depletion of E. And when we go to cerebral knockout cells or we make that chemical modification to the E3 ligand, we lose that activity. And so this depletion activity is also associated with antiviral activity. So here I'm showing you the parental inhibitor in black and then the degrader in red um, for GNF2 and then the 212-2 scaffold. And in both cases, by going to a degrader mechanism, we pick up a lot of antiviral potency. That increase in potency is itself cerebellon dependent and that if we go to any sort of condition in which we prevent interaction of the compound with cerebellon, either by going to the knockout cell line or having the chemical modification on the ether ligand or both, the antiviral activity reverts the activity of the parental compound, which you see really nicely for GNF2. The data for 212-2 are a little bit messier, but you see it's still the same general trend. So this increase in potency is associated with this change in mecha pharmacological mechanism. Um, 
that led us to ask, well, how are these acting? Are they affecting fusion? Or are they affecting, which is what the parental inhibitors do, or are they affecting assembly? In terms of fusion, because we have so many assays, that's easy to determine. And what I can tell you is that they affect fusion, but it's not due to targeted protein degradation. And the activity is actually the same activity that we see for the parental inhibitor. Right? And so these are under compound, compound treatment conditions under which we can only affect entry, and the activity is the same for the degrader and the inhibitor. So then to get at, are we affecting production of particles, we went to a VLP system um, in which we express E with its chaperone PRM, and that's sufficient to drive um, but spontaneous budding and secretion of virus-like particles. And so in our experiments, we do that transfection, and after different time intervals, we lyse the cells to quantify intracellular E. We also harvest supernatants and do peg precipitations, ultracentrifugations to isolate the VLPs. Um, and so we did this for the parental inhibitors and also the degraders. And so the first thing to point out is that, to my surprise, or to our surprise, is that the parental inhibitors actually affect intracellular E and VLP secretion. And we don't understand yet what the mechanism is there, um, although that's an, active er that's an area that I'm very interested in the lab pursuing further. The thing I want to point out is that the two degraders have the same activity, and it is cerebellum dependent, and that we don't see it when we go to the cerebellum knockout cell lines. Okay, and so that's the activity I want you to focus on and think about, because those are the compounds then we carried forward in terms of looking at resistance mutations. And so in our prior work, and Bianca has more information about these mutations on her poster, um, we had done cytotoxic immunogenesis on recombinant protein to identify substitutions in magenta that reduce binding by fivefold or more, so fivefold or, or greater increase in KD, as well as a couple of substitutions that had no effect on binding to recombinant protein. And the Pichunin lab had performed reverse genetics to introduce these point mutations to whole virus and looked at um, sensitivity to the inhibitors and indeed substitutions that reduce binding also reduce sensitivity to the inhibitors. These are single concentration experiments, but she did full titrations as well. And so we could take these mutations and ask how does the degrader perform against those? And what we see is that the degrader is actually as good against these two point mutations as they are against wild type. Again, which we think is consistent with our hypothesis that this mechanism is itself more resilient to single mutations that would reduce compound binding. Again, because its pharmacology is event-driven, not occupancy-driven. Okay, and the last thing I want to show you is it has to do with spectrum activity. And so this is a phylogenetic tree that Wolfinger and colleagues had published based on E-protein sequence, envelope protein sequence. So we have the four dengue serotypes, and then Zika, West Nile, Japanese encephalitis virus, and yellow fever virus. And once we get past yellow fever, these two are tick-borne. And so first of all, um, going back to the idea of like having small molecules that are not just affecting fusion, but are affecting fusion and assembly, when we tested the fusion inhibitors and only allowed them to inhibit viral entry by temporally controlling when the compound was around, we see activity against dengue and we also see activity against Zika, but it's really pretty crappy. And the, like the EC90 value for Zika for GNF2 is over 100 micromolar, and I think for 212 it's, it's 40 micromolar. If we allow the compound to be around and affect both of those processes, once we knew that they were affecting both processes, you see an improvement going from 107 micromolar here to um, 10 micromolar, 9 micromolar here, and a similar improvement for the parental inhibitor. But the important thing is that in blue, which is the degrader, the degrader is always more potent. And we extend this to looking at these other viruses, mosquito-borne flaviviruses, we see something similar in that the degrader is always more potent than the parental inhibitor. And in a couple cases, the parental inhibitor really is not good at all. For example, West Nile, the Kunjin variant of West Nile virus, we don't have great activity with GNF2, but the GNF2 degrader does fine against it. Again, so th this represents natural diversity and that we've been able to broaden the antiviral activity of these agents by converting them from an inhibitor mechanism to um, a targeted protein degradation mechanism. And so that's NF2. Um, we're interested in applying this to other targets and also other viral families. And we're especially interested in applying this against things that have been hard to drug like NS1, right? Where you might want to inhibit it, but it's not always clear how you accomplish that with a small molecule. And in this case, by instead trying to deplete the protein from the cell, could you have could you achieve the antiviral effect that you want or the immunomodulatory effect that you, that you want? Okay, so again, this was the idea that we're continuing to pursue in the laboratory, and I have to acknowledge, um, again, the people who did the work. 
um, as well as funding. Um, we started this with seed money from Harvard, from internal funding when I was still at Harvard, and now we're generously funded by NIH. Thank you. Yeah, I have one. Uh, really interesting talk. So when you showed the volcano plots for the NS3 degrader, it looked like there were a whole bunch of proteins that were upregulated. So uh, what were they and what's the mechanism of that? That was, I th we think that this is general and that some, this is an effect of we're clogging the proteasome, like we're competing with all of the natural things that are being turned over for utilization of the proteasome. And some we can make that go away depending on the, the duration of the compound treatment and that particular data set, it went longer. And I think that's why we saw this like increase across the board in a lot of proteins. Thanks. And we didn't see, like, and you didn't see it, it's also consistent with like the, the negative control compound because it can't engage the E3 ligase and so that activity went away. Uh, Francisco Zapatero, lab, uh, just to follow up on that question, would it be mm -hmm. possible that those are actually targets of the NS3, so host factors that are being targeted by NS3 itself? Potentially, yes. I mean, and we haven't really delved into, into that list very, mu very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Very nice talk. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, Regular antivirals are, the efficacy of regular antivirals is very much in, uh, attuned to potency as well as pharmacokinetics. Do you think that the event-driven um, activity of the degraders will have the same stringency for PK? I think it will be very, it's very, at least looking at what the people in oncology and cancer biology are observing, it's one, very target dependent, but in some cases where the resynthesis rate is slower, you don't actually have to have great PK just because you efficiently deplete and the resynthesis is slow enough that you don't see recovery of the, you know, the, of the, of the cancer cell. And so I think there could be some antiviral targets where again, you do need some binding, but the requirement to maintain above a certain level is maybe more relaxed. I mean, and conversely, there could be some viral proteins that are resynthesized very rapidly, and you may have even more stringent PK right, requirements. Right. Maybe you need to go for the much less abundant viral proteins. That's not, uh, yeah, I think so, but I don't know. I mean, I think it's still, I mean, the, the field, not just for antivirals, but for, for in cancer and in autoimmunity and other people, you know, other area, disease areas, what makes a good drug target for this approach is still being defined. And a lot of the conventional ideas we have for normal, normal drugs mm -hmm. don't, don't necessarily appear to apply. And so I think every, the advice I'm always given and that now I give to other people is like, you kind of have to empirically establish what's going on and eventually we will hopefully see patterns. Great, thank you. So your, a protein of interest you may want to degrade could be in many different places in the cell, right? Mm -hmm. So my question is, you use the specific adapter protein yeah. to hijack a specific E3 ligase. So in different cell types, I'm assuming there's different levels of different adapters and also mm -hmm. E3 ligase is complex, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, kind of what's the status of the field on developing a drug for different E3 ligase complexes or adapter proteins right. to so, degrade your target of interest wherever it may be. Yeah. yeah, so people, so the reality is of the hundreds of E3 ligases, we only have good ligands for a handful. So the companies pursuing this, most of them have platforms now trying to define, because you can use that, right, for selectivity and avoiding tissue toxicities into, right, uh, have platforms looking for E3 liga ligands for the E3 ligases that they're interested in. I think it'd be really interesting to like make small molecules against um, viral E3 adapter proteins, right? Um, but that's all emerging. I think for those of us on the academic side that don't have access to a huge platform by that, it's empirical. We know the good ligand, we know the ligands for which we have E3 ligases and you, you start. I mean, look with the envelope protein story, I did not think it would work because that gets inserted to the luminal side. Well, what I have been told is it gets inserted to the luminal side of the ER, and I did not think it would have be accessible to this cytosolic E3 ligase, but yet it worked. So this, which again goes back to I don't think there are hard and fast rules. If you want to do it, you end up just trying it and seeing what works. And a lot of times, it's, you think it ought to work and it doesn't, and then conversely, you think there's no way it will work. I didn't think the E would degrader would work, and the people in lab did it anyways. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, very, and it worked. Very cool. Seems like yeah. we're learning the rules. Yeah. 